Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Uh, this week, I was able to return from my first congressional delegation trip that I've led uh, to Ghana and to Israel. Uh, it was a delegation that broadly reflected the House Democratic Caucus, including the top Democrat on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, the top Democrat on the Middle Eastern Subcommittee, the top Democrat on the Africa Subcommittee, as well as the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, several other members of the Congressional Black Caucus, and several Jewish members of the House Democratic Caucus, broadly reflecting the diversity of what House Democrats represent. We had a wonderful meeting uh, with President Akufo Addo in Ghana to talk about our shared commitment to democracy throughout the country and the challenges that democracies are confronting. We thanked the President for his close partnership with the United States on the UN Security Council. Also discussed several of the regional security concerns that exist with respect to coastal West Africa. We also as a delegation had an opportunity to visit the Cape Coast slave castles in Ghana, uh, and it was a very moving opportunity to revisit some of the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade, but also use it as an opportunity to have discussions with the people of Ghana uh, about how we emerge uh, from that history to build a better world for everyone. We also had an opportunity to have several substantive meetings in Israel with President Herzog, Prime Minister Netanyahu, opposition leader Lapid, uh, and other members uh, of the government, including the Speaker of the Knesset, about, one, our continued strong commitment to making sure that Israel uh, remains a vibrant, safe, and secure Jewish democratic state, uh, and our continued commitment to the shared values related to democracy and what that has represented in terms of the special relationship that we have between our two countries. We, of course, discussed issues such as stopping Iran from becoming nuclear capable, prospects for a two-state solution, building upon the Abraham Accords, how do we create a better environment for peace in a very difficult neighborhood? And we also discussed the judicial reform proposals that have created a lot of controversy in Israel. And we've simply said uh, that we're hopeful that common ground can be found in a manner that respects and protects the independence of the judiciary as well as the rule of law. And these were principles that every single one of the leaders we met with uh, agreed should be operating principles in terms of trying to find common ground. This week in Washington, D.C., we've seen House Republicans once again stake out an extreme position, which is to risk a catastrophic and dangerous default that would potentially trigger a job-killing recession and cost the American people millions of good-paying jobs, crash the stock market in a way uh, that will hurt and undermine the retirement security of millions of older Americans, and also send costs skyrocketing through the roof in a way that will hurt the economic well-being of everyday Americans. America should always pay her bills, period, full stop. We've never defaulted in the history of this country in a manner that is being contemplated by extreme MAGA Republicans in the House of Representatives that will hurt the economy, hurt industry, hurt small businesses, and hurt everyday Americans. House Democrats worked with former President Trump three times 
to make sure we avoided a default and raised the debt ceiling. Without partisanship, without showmanship, without gamesmanship. And that's what the extreme MAGA Republicans should be doing right now. And as we've indicated, we will have a conversation with House Republicans about the budget, about future spending priorities, about which type of investment should be made to continue to have a strong and robust American economy into the future. We are willing to have that conversation. President Biden has produced a budget. House Republicans produced a ransom note. That is what the Default on America Act is, and that is wildly irresponsible. Questions? Uh, when you say it's not moving, moving the needle with Republicans, what do you mean? Well, I mean, it seems neither side is blinking. Republicans have their plan. You guys want a clean debt ceiling increase, and nobody seems to be sitting down at the table with each other. Well, our position will continue to be clear that the only responsible thing to do with respect to avoiding a catastrophic default on our debt is to do what has consistently been done under Democratic presidents and Republican presidents, which is to make sure that America pays her bills. That is the only responsible position at this particular point in time. Now, the Default on America Act was sent over to the Senate. The Senate will have to take steps uh, to evaluate that legislation. What seems clear to everyone is that it's dead on arrival. It's not a serious proposal. It doesn't even have support from many of the Senate Republicans. That's the untenable position that exists in the Congress right now. Uh, the president has continued to make clear that he is willing to talk to anyone on Capitol Hill about the type of spending decisions investment decisions, and revenue decisions that should be made to protect the health, the safety, and the economic well-being of the American people. There is a process for that to occur. It's called the budget. President Biden has released his budget. Over a month ago, President Biden's budget will create an economy that works for everyday Americans. His budget will protect and strengthen Social Security. His budget will cut the deficit by $3 trillion. We are still waiting for House Republicans to produce a budget. They produced a ransom note and said, pass our irresponsible default on America Act or else we're going to default. That's not serious. That's not responsible. Mr. Chad. understand how tough it is to pass a, a pay raise each year, but is there a concern that some in the public might interpret this as a pay raise? Are members getting something extra on top of this, and is that politically a problem? No. Why not? It's a reimbursement. But, but talk about that. Couldn't people perceive that as, a, as an issue? I know that was something you, you argued for back in December. Uh, the effort to make sure that members are reimbursed for housing expenses has been uh, bipartisan in nature from the very beginning. It was a bipartisan recommendation from the House Modernization Committee. There was then a bipartisan unanimous vote taken by the House Administration Committee in late December of 2022. There was a bipartisan process working with the nonpartisan CAO uh, to develop procedures for the reimbursement mechanism to be appropriately implemented, and then another bipartisan unanimous vote was taken at the end of March. Mr. Jeffrey. Go back to this side. Uh, Senator Jeffrey, failing on the next chart, while this is all going on with these discussions and the GDP numbers are out this week showing a slowdown, <coughs> but what do you have to say to those who say you and Democrats and even Republicans are slowing down the process as a cloud of economic worry hangs over people's heads? 
Well, one of the reasons why it's important to continue the economic progress that has been made under the Biden administration, bringing unemployment down, wages on the way up, more than 12 million good paying jobs being created, inflationary pressures beginning to slow. Uh, that's progress that has been made. We've emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic as a country stronger than any other developed country in the world in terms of the economy. But there are still concerns. And so what we should be doing is responsibly getting to work on behalf of everyday Americans, not engaging in a reckless, dangerous default showdown that risks a recession, risks a stock market crash, and wish, risks adding to the inflationary pressures that currently exist. Mr. Well, second row, and then we'll come back. Well, we have to make sure um, that there's order at the border, as President Biden has continued to do. I think some of the steps that have recently been indicated they will take in terms of in-process, uh, in-country centers uh, in order to deal with um, the tremendous inflow of migrants from certain countries is a responsible step. Uh, we're still waiting on additional information to be presented to us in terms of the comprehensive nature of the plan, but I have every confidence that President Biden and the administration are going to take the appropriate steps to address comprehensive immigration reform issues as well as issues that exist uh, on the border. In terms of the uh, extreme MAGA Republican plan on immigration, that's just another dead on arrival bill catering to the far-right extreme of the Republican Party. Mr. 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 Hold on. Thank you, Ashley Banks with the Trio. This week, Jake Johnson, he held a presser on reintroducing the Rap Act to prohibit rappers' lyrics from being used against them in the courtroom, like what we're seeing in the case of rapper Young Thug. Uh, in your opinion, why is this bill essential? Well, I've supported the Rap Act in the past. I don't think that art and creativity should be weaponized, uh, in the criminal justice system, and hopefully we'll be able to find some bipartisan support uh, to move that legislation forward. Mr. 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 Jeffrey, uh, you have two Democratic absences this week. Are you disappointed that if you had full attendance here, you could have te temporarily defeated this bill? People um, who are members of Congress have things that happen in life. Uh, that they have to address. Uh, we maximize the attendance possible. Catherine Clark is doing a great job. But there will always be circumstances, unfortunately, that because of life issues, um, members from time to time won't be present on the House floor. We were able to hold together Democratic unity in opposition to an extreme MAGA Republican default on America bill that is bad for everyday Americans, bad for the economy, uh, and bad for the world and America's place in it. And that's uh, where I think we should keep the focus. And just to clarify your position on the no negotiating stance, if we're heading into a default, you are totally comfortable with the president saying no negotiation whatsoever with the speaker on the debt limit, even as we head off the cliff. I think President Biden's position is very consistent with President Trump's position, with Speaker Paul Ryan's position, with President Ronald Reagan's position, which is simply that America should pay its bills and avoid a catastrophic and dangerous default. That's not a partisan position. That's not a Democratic position that President Biden is taking. That is the American position. It's the same position that Donald Trump took in 2019. Same position that former President Reagan took during his administration around the debt ceiling. Consistently, and it's also the position that fiscal conservative Paul Ryan took as speaker. And so I'm very comfortable with the notion that, yes, America should always pay its bills, while at the same time engaging in negotiations and discussions around the budget 
and the appropriations. So, Go back to the side, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can you just assess a little bit how proprietary the Republicans um, were able to kind of pull together on this bill? That it was likely after many twists and turns to get to this job that they were to, uh, you know, secure passage. And can you assess that as kind of a, a one-off, or or do you need to see them kind of interviewing the House Republicans? what they can do if they hold together? Yeah, it did not surprise me at all. First of all, the only group that held together were House Democrats. All of us voted, voted no. On the other side of the aisle, you had several House Republicans who voted against the Default on America Act because it wasn't extreme enough for the right wing. It was a very extreme bill that will hurt middle-class America all those who aspire to be part of the middle class, working families, young people, seniors, veterans, the poor, the sick, the afflicted, the least, the lost, and the left behind. The Default on America Act will hurt everyday Americans. But we are not surprised that so-called Republican moderates who talk a good game, but at the end of the day, always, always, always vote with the extremists. That's been the case throughout the 118th Congress on bill after bill after bill. And that's going to be a decision at the end of the day for their constituents to make about why there are members of the House of Representatives who either at home or on TV talk like moderates and then always, here in Washington, D.C., vote with the extreme MAGA Republicans. So I wasn't surprised at all, because just in the last several months, we've gotten used to people expressing concern about attacks on reproductive freedom and the effort to criminalize abortion care, and then vote to criminalize abortion care. We've had so-called moderate Republicans express concerns with the effort to ban books and put politics over parents on TV and back at home, and then vote to ban books or to bully transgender children. And so we saw the same playbook back at home so-called House moderates, Republicans, talk about concerns with the extreme nature of the cuts in the Default on America Act, go on TV and pretend as if they're concerned, and then come to the Florida House of Representatives and vote with the extreme MAGA Republicans. Ultimately, they are going to have to answer for their hypocrisy. A group of bipartisan senators have uh, introduced a bill that would ban social media for kids under the age of 13 and severely limit it to kids 13 to 17. Is that something you would support? Is it something you think Congress needs to look at? And if so, do you think there's a way for the government to enforce a ban? Yeah, I haven't seen a specific bill. Uh, it obviously seems to be far-reaching, uh, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment at this particular point in time. Thanks. Many of the Republicans are making uh, an issue about the migrant children and the missing migrant they're dealing with as they're being held uh, in this processing centers all across the country. What's your reaction to all of this and the migrant children and what needs to be done? Well, I mean, I think that we need to ensure, as it relates to the migrant issue, that we are both anchoring ourselves in compassion, in kindness, in humanity, which are all values that are central to who we are as Americans, particularly as it relates to vulnerable children, while at the same time working to find a comprehensive bipartisan resolution to dealing with the migrant crisis that we've seen, not just over the last few months or last few years, but over the last few administrations, both Democratic 
and Republican. If the Republicans are really interested in finding a real solution to this challenge, we welcome that conversation. Uh, I'm just concerned uh, that too many of the extreme MAGA Republicans have chosen to try and weaponize the immigration issue, not to solve the problem, but to try to maximize political advantage. Weaponize meaning that blaming it on President Biden not doing enough to protect these children? That's correct. Are you concerned that Congress is leaving for a week without any clear pathway forward on debt? Well, it's my understanding that the Senate is going to be in session uh, next week. And we're going to have to find a way forward. Next week we will hear, I think, uh, from the Treasury Department as to when they will run out of extraordinary measures. And I think once we have that date with clarity, which will be based on an evaluation of the tax receipts that have now come into the Treasury, then we'll know with some urgency uh, our time frame for dealing with this challenge. Understand, this is a manufactured crisis that extreme MAGA Republicans are trying to force on the American people. Again, Democrats raised the debt ceiling to avoid a dangerous default three times during the Trump presidency, even though we strongly disagreed with his spending priorities. And this country has been around for 247 years, yet 25% of America's debt was accumulated during the four years of the Trump presidency. But we still did not play games, threaten a default for political purposes, because it's just our position that the right thing to do is for America to always pay her bills. And as far as I'm concerned, that's never a position that we should waver from, whether it's a Democratic president or Republican president. Last question. Do you believe that speaking Take this one and then this one, yeah. Uh, do you Sorry. believe that Speaker McCarthy would, would uh, get you along with Gore that could pick up enough Democratic votes to pass, even if it meant you know, risking the notion of vacating the House part of the House and indicting you? Well, that's probably a question that's best asked uh, of Speaker McCarthy, at the end of the day, we are just going to have to do the right thing here, regardless of what political inconvenience may be presented. That's what all of us in the Congress are called upon to do, the right thing by the American people. And in this particular case, there is only one approach that is correct, which is to make sure that we avoid a default and that America pays its bills. Okay, I'll take this last question. Thank you, Leader Jeffries. I was wondering if you could speak on this solar policy that uh, we have Senate Democrats coming out and saying that they think that this hurts American manufacturing of solar panels and enables China manufacturing of solar panels. Is that a fair sentiment? And why do you think you need to stay in place? Well, the League of Conservation Voters supported the House Democratic position uh, as overwhelmingly expressed in our opposition. Uh, to the legislation that was on the floor this week. The overwhelming majority of organized labor are in sync with the House Democratic Caucus position uh, in terms of supporting the temporary regulations that the Biden administration put in place with respect to the solar industry. Uh, and the solar industry supports the Biden administration position. Individual members of the House or the Senate may take a different approach and often that is based on regional, local concerns, and that's understandable. But in terms of the right policy for the American people, uh, I think President Biden uh, is doing exactly the right thing. Thank you, everyone.